Night's Journey by Ave, Part 3, Chapter 2 That the girl was gone confounded me. For a few moments, I could do nothing but stand there gaping. I'd left her weak enough, or so it seemed, that the thought of her going anywhere had not even remotely occurred to me. I was so startled that my reaction was one of anger. Anger that she should have betrayed me. I who had saved her. I who had trusted her. With such sentiments bursting in upon me, it's hardly a surprise what I did next. I plunged into the thicket in pursuit, assuming that she was trying to escape and was making for the narrow channel I had told her about. Pushing my way through the heavy growth proved no easier than it had earlier. The tangled mass of trees and bushes caught me with every hasty, rushing step. My bare feet were no help. More than once I tripped and had to catch myself from falling. Nonetheless, I plunged on straight across what I thought would be the fastest way to the island's other side. As I fought my way through, I became angrier. She was in the wrong to run away from me. It made me all the more determined to make her my prisoner. I would show her, I would show everyone, that I was not to be trifled with. Out I burst on the Pennsylvania side of the island, there to stand upon the shore. But looking up and down, I saw nothing, not one clue to indicate where she was. My perplexity was great, for if she didn't come that way, she could only be hiding on the island. The area in which she could conceal herself was small, but within it, she could be anywhere, and I must confess it. I even considered that she might attack me. I thought of firing my gun to signal the other men, who might still be on the hunt. I checked myself, however, when I considered how they would mock me for my inability to catch her. How could I not catch her? I asked myself. Wasn't she only a girl? Not to catch her by myself would be the greatest dishonor of all. Once more, I checked the priming of my rifle, making sure it would not misfire. That done, I turned toward the island. I decided I'd be best served if I stayed on the western side of the island, reasoning that she was intent on reaching the mainland and thus would have to pass me at some point. Further, I assumed that she would never again cast herself into the main current of the river. In that sense, I had her trapped on Morgan's Rock. I took my first stand at the spot where I commanded the widest possible view, hoping to cut her off the moment she revealed herself. Just how long I waited, I'm not sure. It could not have been more than moments, for I was impatient, nervous, and impulsive. I preferred to move about. Wading farther into the water, I slowly stepped northward up the channel toward the rock itself. My gun was in readiness, its flint cocked. I moved cautiously, as silently as possible, casting looks forward and behind. Even so, the splashing of my steps seemed loud. I forced myself to walk slower. Gradually, I moved upstream until I could get no closer to the rock without being in the water about its base. There, the vegetation was sparse. I could see across the whole island. She was not there. Turning about, I started back downstream, covering the same area I had gone over before, but moving with yet more care, peering into the tree cover and bushes as I went. Still, she eluded me. With every moment my frustration mounted, I made myself continue south, stopping, turning with each step, my rifle always ready. When I had crossed perhaps one quarter down the island's length, she sprang out some 20 feet behind me like the bursting of a pheasant from the bush. I must have passed right in front of her without noticing her at all. Now she leaped frantically into the water and, abandoning all pretense of concealing herself, plunged into the channel, skipping this way and that, trying to reach the mainland. As soon as I had recovered from my surprise, I shouted, Stop! She paid me no heed, but continued to run. 
I lifted my rifle to my shoulder, even as I called my warning once again. But she listened to me no more than she had done before. I aimed and pulled the trigger. The rifle fired. Her high, sharp cry upon being hit was instantaneous. Halfway around, she spun, then collapsed into the water as if dead. When I saw what I had done, I stood there motionless, horrified. I was certain that I had killed her. It was as if the Lord's fist had reached down and gripped me around the chest, squeezing out every breath I had. How long I stood there, I cannot say, but it was long enough for me to fling the gun away as if it were some defiled thing. Where it went, I never knew, for I never saw it again. I ran forward to where she lay in water, already red with blood, and hauled her up. She made no resistance. Frantically, I dragged her back toward the island, unmindful of any hurt I might be doing. At the shore, I lay her on the ground, face up. Her eyes were closed, her face a dreadful white, her soaking hair marked with red. I forced myself to search for where I had struck her. It was not difficult to find, for the blood still flowed. The bullet had cut her arm. No more, but no less either. A sensation of joy that the wound was no worse swept over me, to be immediately followed by a renewed fear for what I had done. Hastily, I pulled Mr. Shin's handkerchief from my pocket and tried to stop the blood, but the linen cloth was too small. I pulled off my shirt and, trembling, began to tear at it, trying to create long strips. These I tightly bound around her wound to stop the blood. It worked better than the handkerchief had done. The bleeding lessened. Stepping back, I saw the ground on which she lay was wet and marshy. I had to move her. When I picked her up, she moaned. What her cry when I had shot her had not done, what her blood had had not done, that one sound accomplished. I began to cry, great sobbing cries that shook me. I was crying for her and for myself, tears I had not allowed myself when I was most alone. Even so, I carried her inland, trying to find a place to put her. I stumbled about all but falling till I found a place. Then I eased her down, leaning her against a tree. Checking the strips I had tied around her arm, I saw to my relief that the bleeding had abated. I tied the knots tighter, then stood back to watch. She opened her eyes but seemed completely numb, unable to say a thing. I had never before been so frightened. I was afraid to move, yet afraid not to, for I did not know how dangerous her condition was. I believed, I wanted to believe, that the wound was slight. But still, I couldn't choose whether to stay with her or go for help. Either way might prove fatal. As it was, I did nothing but remained standing before her with the vague hope that my wishes and my prayers, which I offered up in multitudes through my tears, would be of help to her as well as to me. When at last she opened her eyes fully, it was only to stare at me. Forgive me, I stammered clumsily. I didn't think to hurt you. I didn't. She gave no reply. Not knowing what else to do, I sat down before her and waited. In time, she asked for water, which I was only too glad to bring her in my hands. Having sucked it up, she managed to hold up her head and keep her eyes open though she continued to look only at me. The look kept me there until she lifted her right arm, extending her palm, put the branded hand in front of my eyes. Forgive me, I repeated, unable to look. Her hand dropped, her eyes closed. She gave me no reply. Does it hurt very much? I ventured after a while. She would not say. Do you want me to get help? I tried. Still, she made no reply. I could take you to my home, I pleaded. Mr. Shin will help you. I know she will. 
She shook her head no. I promise, I fairly pleaded. You won't be harmed. I went on to give her every reason I could think of why she should allow me to bring her there. To none of these would she agree, but kept shaking her head obstinately to everything I said. Then, in the midst of all my urging, we heard a voice. Peter! Peter York! Are thee there? Mr. Shin had come back to find me. And we'll go on with the next chapter in the next video. Hey, please click like, subscribe to the channel. Leave a comment down below. I really want to hear from you. I love you guys. As Tigger says, ta-ta for now.